In a few minutes, we're going to hear one of Jesus' parables. But first, I want to share with you a modern day parable that might help you to make more sense of the parable that Jesus tells. So there was once a pub called The Hound and Tankard. The Hound and Tankard was owned by a very rich man called Mr. S. Tingy. Mr. S. Tingy set the price of a pint at not four pounds, not five pounds, but eight pounds. Hopefully inflation never gets so bad that this becomes a reality. Now, Mr. S. Tingy employed a manager to run his pub. The manager's name was Horace. And all the regulars at the Hound and Tankard, they loved Horace because he was a very hospitable and generous man. Horace knew that people couldn't always afford eight pounds a pint, especially when it was a couple of days from payday. So Horace let people keep a tab which they could pay off whenever they were able to. And as you can imagine, Mr. S. Tingy was not very happy that Horace was letting people keep a tab. He said, Horace, If you're going to let people keep a tab, I'm going to charge interest. If I must be their creditor, I'm going to charge them for the service. Now, Horace was a very hospitable and generous man, as I've mentioned, and so he felt guilty that his patrons were going to be charged interest on top of Mr. S. Tingy's steep prices. So one day, when Mr. S. Tingy wasn't looking, Horace gave away a round of drinks on the house as an apology for the interest Mr. S. Tingy was charging them. But Mr. S. Tingy was doing a stock take one day and he found that Horace must have given away some pints for free. And so he called Horace into the office and fired him on the spot for wasting his stock and being a dishonest manager. Horace was not a confrontational man, so he said he'd go quietly after finishing his shift. But then, While pouring pints for the very last time, Horace realised something. Perhaps losing his job wasn't the worst thing. The regulars at the pub had become friends, and making money out of them for Mr S Tingy was distorting that. He didn't want to exploit his friends to make money. He wanted to be generous and hospitable, and in turn receive their generosity and hospitality. So... Horace came up with a clever plan to strengthen his friendships further. That night, he sat down with some of the regulars and deducted their tabs by the amount of interest Mr. S. Tingy had charged them. And for some, their bills were cut in half. The regulars were overjoyed. They paid the rest of their bills up front to Horace and closed their tabs for good. When Mr. S. Tingy found out at the, ne- the next day, he really wasn't happy about this. He wasn't happy with Horace. But there was nothing he could do. Horace had left. He'd left his job. He'd been fired. And the tabs had been closed. And he couldn't go after the interest now because that would just look petty. So Mr. S. Tingy called up Horace and said, Horace, you clever fool. You're a terrible businessman but a very good friend. The end. That's the parable. Okay, now you're going to hear Jesus' parable now. Um, But actually, before we get to that, let's have a think about the story. I wonder what you made of it. Who did you sympathise with? Who sympathised with Mr. S. Tingy? Who sympathised with Horace? Who sympathised with the pub regulars? Okay. I wonder if you thought Horace's dishonesty was justified or whether it was, his dishonesty was inexcusable. I wonder who, if anyone in this story, reminded you of Jesus. So we're going to hear a, a, a similar parable, but Jesus' parable. So Maureen's going to come and bring that for us. Good morning, everybody. The parable today comes from Luke, Luke, <laughs> Luke, <laughs> Luke 16, 1 to 15. Jesus told his disciples, 
there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what's this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will come, will welcome me into their homes. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 3,000 litres of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 1,500. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? 30 tons of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 24. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. But the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. He said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of others, but God knows your hearts. What people value highly is detestable in God's sight. This parable is renowned for being very difficult to interpret. I read three commentaries on this passage and then another three interpretations online, and they all said different things and came at it from different angles. And the, the biggest difficulty seems to be why is the manager commended by the master for being shrewd when he's being very dishonest? Surely dishonesty is a bad thing. For me, the story makes so much more sense if we assume that the rich master is charging his customers interest. Jews were forbidden to lend money at interest and lend things like olive oil and wheat at interest. And although there's no explicit mention of interest in this text, like there is in, was in my parable, it would explain why the shrewd manager is able to just deduct the debts so quickly and yet be commended at the end. The rich master knows he has no rightful claim to the interest that he charged his customers. There is a great contrast in this parable. While the rich master uses would-be friends to make money, the shrewd manager seems to use money to make friends, or at least the cancellation of debts to make friends. Jesus applies this parable by teaching his disciples to use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves, so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Those words of Jesus, they could be used and have been used, misused to claim that one can pay their way to heaven or that one should make friends through bribery or the giving of extravagant gifts. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like Jesus to me. That doesn't sound like something Jesus would recommend. I wonder if the meaning is much simpler. 
Use what is temporal, finite, in the service of the eternal, rather than using what is eternal in the service of the temporal, the finite. In numerous places in the Old Testament, we read that God's love endures forever. And in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, love never fails. Real love, the kind of love revealed in Jesus Christ, is eternal. And so a friendship, insofar as it is built on the foundation of real love, is not a temporal relationship, but an eternal one. My motto is, if love endures forever then nothing is ever lost in love. If love endures forever, then nothing is ever lost in love, real love. The divine love that emanates from God. But money or wealth is not eternal. It is temporal. It is finite. It's running out. It will be lost. It will be left behind. It will not make it into the new creation. As some of you have said, you can't take it with you. And if that is indeed the case, then surely, surely we should use money to love people and love God in and through people. And have you noticed, though, how often we do the opposite? How often in our world we use people to love money? We use use people, exploit people to love and venerate and honour money. Perhaps this is why Jesus is so clear. This is why he has to be so clear, so black and white on this in his teaching on money. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So we can read this parable as an invitation to use money to love people instead of using people to love money. But I wonder if there's more here. There's more to this parable when we consider how it resonates with Jesus, who Jesus is, what his ministry was like. At the end of our reading, we hear that the Pharisees who loved money heard of all of this and were sneering at Jesus. We know from elsewhere in the Gospel that the Pharisees couldn't understand why Jesus and his disciples ate and drank with tax collectors and sinners. The Pharisees also weren't happy when Jesus healed on the Sabbath. And elsewhere, Jesus criticises the experts in the law for loading people down with burdens that they can hardly carry and not lifting a finger to help them. With all of that in the background... I wonder if the parable about the shrewd manager can help us to understand the relationship between Jesus and the Pharisees and experts in the law. Jesus was seen by them as being too gracious, too gracious, and not tight enough in his observance of the law. He forgave people, healed people, made friends with people, regardless of whether they were law-abiding Jews or not. By doing this, Jesus believed he was fulfilling the weighty aspects of the law. Love, mercy, justice. Meanwhile, the Pharisees and experts in the law, they were keen to add extra laws. Burdens that people could not carry. Metaphorically speaking, they added interest to people's debts. And did not help them to shift the debts. They did not help them find forgiveness. Pharisees brought bad news. Jesus brought good news. The Pharisees emphasised human efforts. Jesus emphasised divine grace. And so we might say that the Pharisees were more like the rich master who probably added interest, while Jesus was more like the shrewd manager who forgave debts. We can't take that too far, that comparison, that analogy. But I find it interesting that just as the manager was fired in the parable, Jesus was sentenced to death by the religious leaders of his time. And Jesus accepted this. He was fired, but worse than fired, he was sentenced to death. He knew he was going down. At this point in Luke's Gospel, he knew he was going down. And so he made friends on his way down. How about us then? What can we take away from this parable? 
Here are three things that I offer, and you can mull, mull over them and experiment there with them this week. See what you think. Firstly, use money to love people. Don't use people to love money. Money is to be used. Money is a means to an end. It is not an end in itself. I wrote my master's dissertation on the ethical idea that we tend to substitute means for ends. We make money an end instead of a means, a goal rather than the servant of the goal. We do this with technology and other things as well, I'd suggest. We need to put things back around the right way. So use money to love people. Don't use people to love money. This doesn't mean bribe. This doesn't mean give extravagant gifts so that a friend feels indebted. That just turns into manipulation. But it means think of where your money is going and consider if people are being loved through its use. And then consider where your money is coming from. And consider if the making of that money has come through the exploitation of people in any way. This is so complicated in today's world because some of us may be benefiting from the exploitation of people and the planet because of how our money is invested. If you have any investments, like private pensions or savings accounts, might you research where your money is being invested and move towards ethical investments? They are out there, ethical investments. Sometimes, we don't even realise it, sometimes we get caught up in systems, sinful systems, evil systems. We don't even realise it. We have to opt out because we automatically opted in. Historically, many people, including Christians, resisted the abolition of slavery. Can you believe that? Christians resisted the abolition of slavery. That was because they thought it would cause the economy to fall. People were used then, and money was loved, and we're still dealing with the hangover from that terrible atrocity. Reparations need to be made, I'd say. But let's learn from history. Use money to love people. Don't use people to love money. Secondly, get a reputation for being gracious and prepare for criticism. Jesus got so much criticism for his way of living the law and loving people. You will too if you follow in Jesus' footsteps. And sure, you could err on the side of nitpicking and extra rules and moral stringency. So many Christians do. So many Christians do. But when you meet Jesus, will he greet you with these words? Well done. You were right after all. Can you imagine Jesus saying that? Well done. You were right. Probably we'll all be a little wrong. But better to be slightly off following in Jesus, following Jesus' example than completely right in our own eyes following the Pharisees and yet completely missing the point in Jesus' eyes. Have you got a reputation yet for being gracious? Or are you known for taking no prisoners? Being right. Laying burdens on people who cannot bear them. And I get that most of us, of course, we want to follow Jesus. We want to follow Jesus inside of grace. But can you handle the criticism that comes with that. It took Jesus down. It took Jesus all the way down, and it can take us down too. And that leads to the third and final idea. Make friends on your way down. Just as the shrewd manager made friends with debtors after, with the debtors after getting fired, there is an opportunity to make new friends every time you lose or let go of something. When you let go of your reputation in the in-group, you can befriend those on the outside of it. When you let go of some of your power or privilege, you can befriend those without it. When you let go of some of your money, you can befriend the poor. When you let go of some of, the, of what you think you know, you can befriend someone who will actually teach you and expand your world, and you can learn from them. When you let go of a life of self-absorption, you can befriend someone who needs your help. And as I come to close, let's shift the focus from us back to Jesus, because Jesus was particularly good at making friends on his way down. 
Even at the cross, even at the cross, he befriended the criminal who was being crucified at his side. He welcomed him into paradise. He went down to the lowest place to make friends with those who were there. This is the message of the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ, that God prefers to be God with us. God went all the way down. This is the incarnation. God went all the way down into human flesh to be God with, them, with us. And then further down into human death. But then further than that, into the most shameful death, into the worst death that human beings could imagine at the time, crucifixion. What does that mean? I wonder if it means that however far we've fallen, we can be sure that Jesus always extends his friendship where we are. Even if life feels like a crucifixion sometimes, and it may well do, there is always hope because we can find a friend there at the crucifixion. A friend there who bears our suffering, bears our pain, bears our sin, and has the power to raise us up to resurrection glory. This is, this is the Jesus kind of God, the God revealed in Jesus, a God who wants to be with us and will go to the deepest, darkest place to find us there, call us friend, and raise us up out. And that's what we heard about right at the beginning from our Psalm 113. Let's go back there at the end. Praise the Lord, he who raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of his people. Amen.